Well, I'm glad you are here today. We are going to continue uh, looking at our guiding principles. What we've done as a church, we know we had a team that's met for a year and came up with, the, really the best way to call it is sandbox, because it, it's more than a mission statement. Uh, it's, it's just a whole lot uh, deeper than just some simple words. Uh, and that's what we've been looking at. We're in the unveiling process of this. Uh, Guiding principles are what we want to be as a church, who we say this is who we are as a church. Preferred culture, our personal goals to work on. So that's the difference. And we've been looking at the guiding principles and understanding how important those are for our lives as a church. This is what we're going to be known for. Uh, Because King's Highway has been here, and if you've seen the float in the back, and it's about remembering our past, because we have a hundred year history of a church celebrating that this year, and it's important important to remember what's built what we have today. But then there's the reality of you can't live in the 70s. You can't live on the past and just keep doing the past and hope that's going to be relevant for the future. But we have to have some key things. There's got to be something that we hold true. You know, I've said before, if wearing a clown wig on my head and a big red nose would bring in 10 new people a week, then I'd wear it. Who cares? I'm still going to preach the gospel because that's who I am. I preach the gospel. But if that attracts people, then great. You know, so you've got to find out what do you hold true to that you say, we're going to make changes, but we're not going to lose sight of these things. That's what we've done. And we looked at a couple of weeks ago being Christ-centered. That if we're going to be a church, that we're going to follow Christ. Christ is going to be the forefront of everything we do. And that's why we have the communion table out in front. It is in the forefront of everything we are. And then last week, we looked at being biblically led. We're going to be Christ-centered as we move in the future. We'll do different things, but Christ will stay in the center. And we're going to trust the Bible. We're going to go by God's Word. Uh, and one of my favorite quotes, uh, you've probably heard this, but the founder, the guy that, one of the guys, there was two, but one of the guys that set up this denomination, this you know, grouping, Christian Church Disciples of Christ, was Thomas Campbell. And he was very clear on this specific topic of being biblically led, because he said, where the Bible speaks, we speak, and where the Bible is silent, we are silent. What does that mean? That means that if the Bible talks about it, then we listen and we do. If it doesn't talk about it, then you know, the way we've interpreted that in our modern time is then we can agree to disagree, but it's not something that you can stand firm on uh, that, that Scripture talks about. But if it's there, that's what we trust. So, we've looked at those for two weeks, excuse me, and uh, what we're going to lead into today, I'm going into the the third one on our list of what we're going to be focused on, and that's being missional minded, mission focused. And one of the things I guarantee you right now, it it doesn't matter, and and talking about, and I'm not discluding people older than 40, but basically in your 40 and under crowd, what they care about, whether they're liberal or conservative leaning, this is universal is missions. People want to be a part of something outside the church. What do they see in denominational churches? Most young people look at denominational churches and see people that care more about the church, care more about keeping things the way they are, care more about making them happy than going out and reaching. Like I said, this spans liberal and conservative. Younger people want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. They want to go out. And you know, if we're going to be Christ-centered and biblically led, then we don't have a choice, right? If we're going to affirm those two, then we've got to come along with being mission-focused as well. Because why? Why do we do mission work? Because if we're Christ-centered and biblically led, then we take seriously that Christ said, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Therefore, stay in a brick building and make disciples. Right? Yes? No? We're here, we're awake, we're asleep. We found the door and we wandered in. No, he doesn't say that. He says go. I like that. Go and make disciples. Go is an action word. It means we have to go, not sit, not stand, not be. Go and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then what I always like to highlight is because we got that, everybody goes, yeah, what's the Great Commission? Yeah, go baptize. We got that. What we forget is in teaching them. 
The last half goes with it. Jesus didn't have much of a pause there. Baptize and teach all that I've commanded you. So, follows along with being Christ-centered. If we're going to be Christ-centered, we're going to obey all that He teaches. Well, He told us to go. That's why we do mission work. And we have to decide, are we going to take the Great Commission seriously? And it's a serious question. And it's something that I think transforms churches. Do we have a vision to see others enter into an authentic relationship with Jesus Christ? And don't shake your head yes if you're not going to willing to get up out of your seat. Because it goes together. You can't say, yes, I want to see other people have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Yes, I know there are people out there that are hurting and struggling and need Jesus in their lives. And hopefully maybe somebody will take it out to them. It doesn't work that way. Sharing the gospel is one of the most important callings as a follower of Jesus Christ that there is. If you believe in Jesus Christ, if you believe that the power of the gospel can save sinners and that biblical truth can transform lives, what are you doing about it? I mean, it it's that simple. You can't say you believe all that and then not act on it. That last song was perfect, Andy. We have to be committed to sharing the gospel with others. And that's what mission work is. But what happens? What happens? And I'll tell you the truth. This is one of the reasons that, that people don't want to be younger people turn away from denominational churches. It's because what happens in denominational churches is we go, you know, we don't have enough money for missions because we have to pay for our building. So we're going to cut out missions. We don't have enough money to support a mission budget, so we're going to cut that out. Many churches, I don't know about this church in particular, but many churches I served at one point in time had a rule that 10% of all the money that came in on a Sunday had to be set aside separate for missions. Most denominational churches cut that out because numbers went down, money got tight, and we have to use that within. That's what they see. And I... And that they see this mentality in denominational churches that it's circle the wagon and take care of ourselves. And, and you, so you see in people, you know, some people make fun of, look at, hey, this church is meeting at a at a school, or they're meeting at a at the Coliseum, or they're meeting somewhere else. Why? Because they don't want to put. You know, we talked about the fact that all of these new pop up churches, you know, have coffee, have casual dress, have everything that we told them. You can't have in the traditional church. They have. And so they've set the f focus of saying, we are going to make sure the money goes to missions. And if it means we don't have a building, we have a building. Because we want to focus on missions. Mission signifies powerful movement. It's about being sent from one place to the other. And Jesus got it. Because what did Jesus do with his disciples? Right? He got disciples together. He got his 12 disciples and he taught them. And then what did he do? said, hey, let's build ourselves a little commune here that we can have everybody come to. Right? No, Jesus sent them out. Right? Taught them what they needed to know and said, all right, now go. And of course, a whole other sermon there, but we know the first time they went out, they were like, oh my gosh, I don't know what I'm doing. But they learned. And they kept going. You're here because they went. They didn't stay in a room. And where we are today, you're here because many generations went and didn't just stay in a room. I want to clarify a little more. This isn't in uh, the explanation of us being mission-minded but because we didn't want to add too many Scriptures to it. But I would add this exactly right behind the Great Commission where Jesus said go. And it's found in Acts. Jesus Christ again talking. He says, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father is set by His own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be My witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and the ends of the earth. So Jesus is talking about when the second coming is going to happen that you're not going to know. But when we receive power, and you receive, if you've been baptized... You believe in Jesus Christ and have been baptized, so you've received this Holy Spirit. You've received it. You have it. So when you have that, and it, so it came on you, 
Again, Jesus' command. Look at the words. You will be. Not you have a choice to be, you might be, you should be. You will be my witnesses. And I always like when I look at this, how Jesus outlines specifically, he says, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. All right? And basically, you've got to put things in context. Where Jesus was when he was saying this was Jerusalem. So what Jesus is saying here, and then Judea was the larger area around Jerusalem. Samaria was the neighbors, Samaritans. You may remember hearing that in the Bible. Bad people. But Jesus went to them too. And then the ends of the earth. So I take that and turn around and I translate it into Shreveport. So Jesus says, when the Spirit comes on you, when you're baptized, you'll be my witnesses in Shreveport, in Louisiana, in the United States, and to the ends of the earth. When I look at missions, that's what I see Jesus saying to us today. We've got to make a decision. We're either going to do what Jesus wants to do, or we're going to do what we want to do. And people have made that choice throughout history, throughout the beginning of the Bible. Adam and Eve made a choice. They're either going to do what they wanted to do or what God wanted them to do. And how'd that choice go? So we know, when we make, when we're not following what God wants for us, when Christ wants for it, it tends not to work out very well. So what's the big question? That was, I was going to show you a map. There's Jerusalem where Jesus was and uh, Judea is this whole pink area, Samaria, their neighbor, and then the ends of the earth. What is the church's mission? In a nutshell, if we're going to be mission-minded, then the church's mission is to glorify God by proclaiming the gospel to the lost and making Christ-like disciples who make Christ-like disciples. It's a repetitive pattern. Another way to say it is the mission of the church is to go into the world and make disciples, followers of Jesus. You know, a disciple, the disciples were people who followed Jesus, learned from him so that they could replicate what he did. That's what the discipleship process is, is that you learn from somebody, knows it, so that then you can go out and teach somebody else that too and replicate it. Uh, the mission of the church is to go into the world and make disciples by declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ and the power of the Spirit we're all empowered by the Holy Spirit, gathering these disciples into churches so that they may worship and obey Jesus Christ and go forth to the world. When you look at the mission statement, I should have had that logo put up, but it's on the front of your bulletins there. It says, grow with God, grow with others, grow in discipleship. It's in that circle with the tree in the middle. We've taken two of Jesus' commands and put them together. The most important command which He answered Love God and love others. Right? And then the Great Commission. Go out and make disciples. That's what's important. Jesus said, make disciples locally, nationally, area-wise, and globally. And that's the responsibility we have. But too often... And this is a critique of the denominational churches. So if I say us, I'm not necessarily meaning King's Highway, but denominational churches, is that we've got so internally focused. And now I say that, and you're going to say, well, you just, you just countermanded yourself. You just said the opposite. Because today we're having an opportunity to sign up. I'm back the tables, the tables back there are ministry teams, ministry opportunities that happen within the church. You're going to say, wow, why, why are you telling me to do something within the church if you're just trying to tell me to go out of the church? Well, it's that discipleship process. One of the things that has happened in the church is that we've focused on those ministry areas, and what I'm talking about is things like Christian education, you've heard of, uh, membership, worship. And we've let that be the end all be all. They're important. They're important because we can't just be a random group of people sitting here doing whatever we want. So we need some internal groups to help organize us. And here's what we've lost with the point of the going. So I've been challenging our teams. So membership needs to know how can they do membership and incorporate... I'm going to start playing your tambourine again. How can we incorporate 
going out in it. So it's not just all about just us and meeting our needs, but moving out. So there's some, there's some sign-up seats if you want to be part sign-up seats. Did that come out right? Uh, back there that you can sign up to be a part of those. But again, we need to accept those as equipping ministries. Things to help organize us in here on how to best make disciples that go forth. So I don't want you to miss those opportunities to do that. The only issue is we can't do it with the expense of missions. Because everything we do needs to point us out. We have to carry out the Great Commission. I'm going to break that down, that first sentence uh, that I made about what the church's mission is, a little bit down to pieces. I said the mission to glorify God by proclaiming the gospel to the lost. Now that's first and foremost our responsibility. We've got to glorify God to those out there. And, and that's hard today. There's a lot of people think when you're trying to bring God out, when you're trying to bring Jesus out, you're trying to be judgmental and judging whatever it is they're doing in their life. Because honestly, we live in a world where the rule is, whatever I'm doing, if it makes me happy, it's right. If you don't like it, you're wrong. It makes it hard. It makes it hard to take the gospel out. Show people a different way. But it never has been easy. I mean, that's what we forget, right? What happened to the disciples? Anybody know? Anybody remember? No? I saw smiles. They were killed. They were killed. So, yes. Is it hard? Yes. Are you going to face persecution? Yes. Are you supposed to do it anyway? Two of you will. Thank you. Yes. What Jesus was all about. Jesus' ministry was centered around proclaiming the gospel. Really? What did Jesus do? That's all he did, right? I mean, he spent three years, after growing up, he spent three years just going out and telling people about the gospel. Okay? Right? Mark 1.14 says, Now after John had been taken into custody, this is right at the beginning, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. What he did was his whole point of his ministry was to point people to God. And at the end of his ministry, he entrusted the disciples and us to continue that work. Period. He entrusted us to be the Great Commission. We're going to have a great song at the end that helps drive that home. We have to answer, will we take up that call? And it's back to if you're going to say, if you're going to agree as being part of this church that we're Christ-centered and biblically led, you really don't have a choice. But if you really believe what it all says, then you should be excited about taking that to others. Breaking it down, the church's mission is also to glorify God by making disciples who love God and one another. Right? Great Commission isn't just about making converts, but making disciples who are obedient followers of Christ. We're to baptize people into Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. We also have to teach them all that He said. All that Jesus commanded. And it's a lifelong process of growth. I'll tell you this, if a person professes to know Jesus Christ as their Savior, but is not seeking to grow in obedience to Jesus' commands, then their profession is shaky. It's easy to say, I believe. And it's easy to say, I believe. And it's easy to get baptized. But if you're not going to grow in obedience to Jesus' commands, if you're not going to do what He says to do, then what did you really do in your confession? Who wants to stand before Jesus and say, I understand, Jesus, that I was to learn all about you and obey you. I was going to get around to it. One of these days. Sorry, I didn't make it before I met you. Maybe you wonder, what are Jesus' commands? I mean, we've got those. I said those. To love God with all your heart. To love your neighbor as yourself. Oops, I skipped ahead. Lastly, 
This is all part of that first church's mission. Make disciples that make disciples. If we aren't willing to make disciples who make disciples, then we're just talking to ourselves. And that's a critique of the established church, that all we care about is ourselves anyway. When you get to be like that, you're like doctors who only want to see patients who are well. It'd be great, wouldn't it, being a doctor? Jesus came to call sinners to repent. Jesus came to help turn people's lives around and show them a different way. That there was a way that could lead to happiness and wholeness. Now, today, and forever. It's a process of multiplication. I read online a British bus company that received complaints because their drivers were speeding past lines of up to 30 people waiting for the bus. Uh, And the company defended its drivers stating, it is impossible for the drivers to keep their timetable if they have to stop for passengers. The company added, if we could just get rid of all the people, the system would run fine. I wonder if we'd say the same thing about church. We can't lose sight of our purpose to glorify God. We can't lose sight of our pur- purpose to be disciple makers that make disciples who make disciples. Focus on anything else puts us off course. So what? That all sounds great. It's easy to nod our heads and agree with that. So what do we do with it? The first, I, I challenged all of our Sunday school classes to come up with some way that they're going to serve the community. And I challenged all the members in the earlier service to come up with a way that you're going to serve the community. And if you want to include some others from the church in it, that's great. But I want you to hear what I didn't say. I didn't say, I want you to tell me Ways that we should serve the community. That's what we do in the church, right? We say, we need to be involved in our community. And everybody goes, yes, yes, yes. And then I'm flooded afterwards with, you know what we need to be doing? We need to be working here. We need to be working here. We need to be working here. Great. I'll, I'll get on that. I'll start working at all those. We think somebody's going to do it. That's where we've got to stop. Not thinking somebody's going to do it, but here's what I'm going to do. And some people hopefully will join me. Because I'm going to serve our community. So, what we do, there's two ways we can be involved. Participation and financial support. Right? If we're claiming the Bible to be true, if we're claiming Christ is our authority, the Bible's true, then we have to be involved in mission work. And like I said, based on what Jesus put out, I look at that as a local, national, and international responsibility. How are you involved in local missions? That's what I want to hear. We have some as a church. We have the food bank, the Highland Blessing Dinner. We're supporting the Shreveport Pregnancy Center. Uh, Mary's Box is out back that we put food in for those in our community uh, that might be homeless or coming by and need some food. That box is out there. Those are some existing ways you can help. But I'd love to, to see more. Local mission is important. It's also one of the hardest mission opportunities to do. I was talking to somebody because uh, anytime you talk, and I get to national and foreign, anytime you start talking about national and foreign, I always have people, every church throughout my whole career, oh, yes, that's important, but we need to take care of our own first. We need to take care of the people in our community. Heard that forever. But you want to know the hardest when you look at missions as local, national, and international. You know what the hardest one is to get people to be a part of? Local. Local, because if I say, hey, we're going to take a mission trip, our youth are going to to New Mexico this year, we're going to take a mission trip to New Mexico, so people take time off, they mark it in their calendar, it's set, untouchable, work's done, whatever responsibilities, and it is set. And it happens, you go and come back. But you say, I come out and say, hey, this weekend I'm going to be building a Habitat church across the street, or a house across the street, who comes and joins to join me? Well, I've got to change the cat litter this weekend, and... I uh, got a laundry to do, and it's just a busy. It's too a bit busy weekend, bad weekend. Yes, but we need to be involved in locally. 
We need to be taking care of our neighbors around us and letting them know that we are here and a part of this community. But it's hard. Second, is the, like I said, is national, and we do that very well right now with our youth mission trip. They were in uh, um, Colorado last summer, going to Mexico, New Mexico this summer, uh, and a great opportunity to share the gospel. Sharing the gospel in word and deed when they go on these, because they end up being at the house of somebody who has felt like nobody cares about them. I've been doing this for 30 years. And most of the time, the houses we work on are people that have tried to get help through the city, tried to get help through other churches, haven't been able to get help, thought it was hopeless, nobody cares about them, nobody loves them, and then a group of teenagers show up at their house to help make some needed repairs and talk to them about the gospel. We need more of those. I'd love to see an adult mission trip, uh, go work on a Habitat house, done that before, in Mississippi or Arkansas. Texas, we need to be involved in our country. Lastly, Jesus said, ends of the earth, which I interpret as international mission. And international mission is important. And it is important to do local. But you're never going to hear me give up and say, well, no, we just don't need to do international mission. Because that's the same thing as just being focused on ourselves inside the church. We live, we are part of a global community. We are part of the world. And there are places in this world that are in a lot worse shape than we are. There are places that know poverty that we don't even begin to know. And so, we need to do something about that. We need to be a part of that. So action items, I'm going to present two opportunities for the church. I already had from first service, some couple of people tell me they want to look into joining me on this. One, somebody that came to the church, we had a lady... Uh, Patty Sue Arnold that came from Casa de Fe is an orphanage in Ecuador. Um, and a lot of these kids that uh, the orphanage has are obviously an orphanage, so they're abandoned kids, but a lot of them come out of the Amazon jungle because where this uh, orphanage is is right on the edge of the Amazon jungle. And in the Amazon jungle, what they do with any kids that aren't normal, I put that in air quotes because I don't know what normal is, but in their culture out there, you know, in the Amazon jungle, if, if they're born with a cleft lip, if they're born with anything that they're not looking perfect and able to do, then what do they do in the Amazon jungle? They just set them out for the animals. Yeah. They don't have medical, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's survival of the strongest. So if there's something wrong with the child, it's just left laying out in the jungle. And, it, and, it's, and this orphanage goes around in the jungle and says, if this happens, just bring them to us. Bring them to us and we'll take care of them. So one of the biggest ministries of this uh, orphanage is to do that, is to take these babies out of the Amazon jungle. And a lot of times, through partners they have here in the United States, you know, they've, they've flown some of the kids here to the United States because some of the problems they have are simple. Things we conquered years and years ago in children and babies. And so they'll fly them over here, we'll fix them and fly them back, and then they work to trying to find them uh, someone to adopt them, but they want to keep them in the country, want to keep them in Ecuador. Uh, so this is a great orphanage, a great ministry. So I'd like to put a trip together. And this is a great opportunity for everybody. You know, some things about mission trips, people say, well, I, I can't build. I, I don't have any skills. The great thing I like about the, uh, uh, and this is what it looks like the orphanage in Ecuador, is they need people, one, that will sit and rock a baby. So if you can sit your took us in a chair, rock back and forth with a baby in your arms, they need you. If you can work in the kitchen and help out getting the meals prepared, they need you. If you want to work outside, working on the building, I mean, think about an orphanage. Think about your house and how many projects there are. This is a huge area that's got always kind of projects. So if you're a, you know, I'm a guy, I want to hammer a hammer or work a wrench, that's out there to do too. So there's everything for people to do. And this is a great opportunity for us to extend our reach from Shreveport at Kings Highway to Ecuador and be able to fulfill the message that Christ gave us, take the message out to the ends of the earth. These people need to see the love of Christ, need to see that somebody cares. And you know, part of it is the always I've said the part of all this is the blessed ministry of showing up. I mean, just making the trip makes a difference in their lives to realize they're important and somebody cares about them.
So if you're interested in being part of a trip to Ecuador, let me know. We're going to start working that up. Like I said, I've already gotten some. Um, get to have fun with the kids. As a, our group that went over there um, used some of our money to take the kids. They have a, a big pool place they can go. We took them there, and we took them to a Chuck E. Cheese's called Mr. Joy, but it was a Chuck E. Cheese's, and we paid to take all the kids there to let them have fun, uh, have an opportunity to do something that they don't get to do very often. Uh, another ministry opportunity uh, that I want to put forth to our congregation is Kenya. I have a friend in Kenya. His name is Bishop Stephen Chege. He's the one in the brown suit right there. Uh, a Kenyan that has gone around ministering in Kenya and Uganda, starting churches. Uh, and I've been with him over there with people that hadn't seen, saw some of those kids, hadn't seen white people before. So this is not going on the party line tour of Kenya. This is going out into the scrub, into the huts, and taking the gospel out. And, and part of what he likes about uh, Americans specifically coming over, or Europeans, is we're the, we're the monkey. All right? We're the one that's the, puts on the show. Because when you say, hey, there's a white person coming, everybody comes out from everywhere, to look at the dancing monkey, which is the white person, because, oh, there's a white person. Uh, and so they love it because we show up and people will come out for that reason. Now, that's not saying we're not getting the gospel, but it's a great way. It's back to that just presence. Just being there brings people out so that he can minister to the gospel. And I want to tell you that this is the most spiritual man I know in my life. I think one of the reasons is, is he doesn't have a lot of things to weigh him down like television. He spends most of his time studying the Bible. And uh, I want to share, he, uh, you know, we read our Bibles, and in the Bible it talks about um, spiritual healing, right? We know that the Bible says uh, we are able to do all the things that Jesus was able to do. So according to the Bible, we can go out and do what Jesus did. We can bring healing to people. Um, and do I believe that? Yes. Why? Because the Bible says it so. But it's kind of a, yeah, I believe it. But what do you do when you're confronted with it? I knew that this gentleman has, has done healings, and I've heard his stories. But at my last church, we had a lady, she's in her 60s, had brain cancer, and been fighting it for two years. They were not able to get any control over it. Uh, she had undergone chemos and surgeries, and just it was bad. Okay, She was getting regular scans. I mean, so this wasn't a couple years going by, but she was getting regular monthly scans. She had a scan, and the cancer was still there doing bad. He came and visited our church. He laid hands on her. He prayed that the cancer would be removed in the, by the power of Jesus Christ. And she went the next week and had a brain scan, and there was not one sign of cancer in her brain. And I'll tell you, and I know it's hard even here to hear that because you're like, okay, yeah. I mean, for my church there, it had us to have to confront, is spiritual healing real? And, you know, I mean, the doctors didn't believe it. She had three scans over the next three weeks. And, and, and to this day, the cancer never came back. And there was no cancer. And the doctors couldn't explain it. No idea how it went away. She did. She dyed her hair. She uh, did a purple stripe in the front of her hair dyed like a big swath of the front of her hair purple so that when people would ask, why do you have purple? She would say, because Jesus healed me. And, and you know, you're confronted with that. and You've got to go, I mean, guess it's real. I can't just believe it as theory as, oh, the Bible says this, but that it's real and can happen. And this is the man that did that. He travels throughout like I said, Kenya and Uganda preaching the gospel. And this group of pastors or power churches that he started in different areas. And this pastor here in the brown jacket on the end uh, was one that my last church took a lot of sympathy in. He's starting this church as this gentleman had a church and his church was built out of mud. It was mud walls uh, and just had some sheet metal across the top and that was his church. Uh, and I was talking with him and his struggle was that he was going to probably get out of ministry because he couldn't feed his family. He'd have to go into um, uh, to uh, 
capital of Kenya. I'm like, Nairobi, thank you. <laughs> I didn't pull that up. Uh, he had to go into Nairobi once a week to get work to feed his family. And you had to understand going into Nairobi once a week to feed his family meant one day, a whole day travel to get in, riding eight to ten hours on a bus to get in, to work a day to get food for his family, to drive eight to ten hours, ride a bus eight to ten hours to get back to his family to supplement what he was doing at the church. And the hard part was because he had a mud church a half a mile away was a Church of Christ church that had a brick church. And, and at first I thought, you know, maybe we don't think this makes sense, but it does today. We have that kind of sensibilities. The problem was the Kenyans would look at it and go, huh, I got a choice. I can go to this church, this group over here that has a God, but they only can have a mud church. Or I can go to this church over here that's got a God that's got a brick church. Wow, I'm going to go to the brick church God and not the mud church God. Because what kind of God is that if that's all they have? And it made it hard. In my last church, we took up his struggle and we built him a brick church. And he's still in ministry today and has a beautiful brick church with a nice roof where he can preach the gospel and is reaching people for Christ. Okay? That's what Jesus has called us to do. And I get, and I'm going to, I want to plan a trip there too. I told him at the first service, the couple I had, all I need is if I get two or three people that say I'm interested, then I'll meet with the two or three of you. We'll talk about all what it takes, what it costs, and we'll set a date and work towards that. We'll invite everybody else to go. But I'm serious. I get two or three and we're going. But I understand some people can't do it. Some people say, I'm not, I can't travel that far. I had a person tell me I, they can't fly on an airplane for that long. Well, that's where we financially support. That's the power of being a church. That's why we have these committees and these internal things so that there's some that can afford to, can afford to go but can't. There's some that have the time and energy to go but can't afford it. So what do we do if we're really church family? Oh, thank you. One person knows. We put those together, right? We put together the ones that can go and the ones that have the resources and patch them up because the goal isn't about this person or that person. The goal is about who we're reaching. And we come together to do that. Bottom line is it always comes back to are we going to do what Jesus told us to do? Are we going to follow His Word and His ways and do it? Or are we not going to do it? You want to know how to make a church grow? Everybody asks. It's missions. The more you focus outside the doors, the more you do get inside the doors. And I know it doesn't make sense. Because what we want to do is focus inside. But then we're doing what we want and not what God wants. A mission-focused church cares more about doing what Christ calls them to do than what they want for themselves. And it's just up to us to choose. Let's pray. God, we thank You for Your Word and Your Son, Jesus Christ, and His example. The Scripture says He didn't even have a place to lay His head. Why? Because He was focused on His mission, which was telling people about the Kingdom of God, helping people find a way to find true happiness now and for all eternity through Him. He didn't stop. And He wasn't afraid of persecution. He wasn't afraid of what other people said about Him. He continued to do God's work. We thank You for Him. We thank You for the disciples that did the same thing. And we thank You for the countless generations that came before us that spread the Word as well. We are who we are today because of what our ancestors have done taking the gospel out. Help give us the power and the strength to do the same thing. In Jesus' name.